must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support. And now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, and my name is Brandon Pollan, and I'm joined by my fellow co-host, Dr. Stephanie Wyrock. Today, we have the esteemed pleasure of welcoming two very special guests on the show to talk about creativity in academia, as we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Matthew Taylor and Dr. Stefan Elgi. And Matthew Taylor's book, Fostering Creativity in Rehabilitation, features a chapter from Stefan called Systemic Limits of Creativity from Academia or Professional Associations. And they were both also hosts of the On Your Authority podcast, also featuring Dr. Michael Lee. Now, gentlemen, thank you so much for your service and for taking the time to speak with us today and our listeners. But, you know, for our listeners who perhaps don't know a little bit about you, do you think you could kind of give our listeners some background into who you guys are and your journey to what you're doing now? I'll let you start, Matt, since you're older than me. Okay, I've got more history to cover. <laughs> uh, 1981 Army Baylor grad, uh, spent eight years in the military, specialized in uh, sports medicine, manual therapy, and burn care. Got out, opened a private practice in Galena, Illinois, a little town of 3,500 in Northwest Illinois, and created what was what we now call a medical gym. Uh, so we had a outpatient practice with medical gym. Had that cranking along, so I went from myself and a part-time aid to 17 employees. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that, my back was getting worse and worse. And uh, one of the interesting things was we got, uh, we'd heard that yoga was going to get hot. So I found the only yoga teacher within 30 miles and got him to come over and and teach a yoga class once a week. And I went just to find out what it was. And two months later, my intractable low back pain that I was supposed to be an expert in was a lot better. So that was one of those transformational where the, you know, you get the rug pulled out from underneath you. Uh, another long story short, started doing a lot of yoga therapy, got associated with the association, started writing articles, decided to get a terminal degree, got a terminal degree where I focused on transformational learning and change as it applies to back care. But basically um, from a, from a yogic type of perspective. Um, ended up being president of the International Association of Yoga Therapists, opened a clinic that was all yoga for 12 years down here in Phoenix, Arizona, and two years ago closed my clinical practice, and now I uh, text things to Stefan when he's supposed to be teaching and watch cat videos and that kind of thing. So. <laughs> You're I get paid big money to come on podcast. So, that, no, no, so now, now I'm working, doing a lot of... Uh, consultation on research and working on uh, a couple national task forces on chronic pain and addiction. That's 38 years. What do you got, Stefan? Well, I was born and raised in Sweden, but I couldn't get into any schools in Sweden, so I had to come over here. (laughs) (laughs) I dropped out of high school, uh, came to Arkansas, knew I wanted to become a physical therapist, so graduated from University of Central Arkansas in 1985. Moved up to Spokane, Washington, because I knew there were a lot of good runners there. Opened my clinic there. Uh, I was lucky in that I, I worked with some of the best runners in the world at World Championships and took care of the elites at New York and Boston, and Berlin Marathons, really big races. I did everything I dreamed of. At the same time, I was also a traveler for about seven years and took lots of different jobs. And then... I decided in about 94 that, you know, something, or maybe it was 93 that, you know, there's more to this. So I went through a four-year Feldenkrais professional training 
because I wanted to learn more about movement and habits and, and see what else was out there. And I was kind of interested in yoga. And then I decided to, to get my PhD, and went back to central Arkansas. And there I met John Kepner. And he said, you know, what do you think about yoga? And it's like, no, oh, you know, it's like glorified exercise. I'm not that interested. And I said, well, can you be on our advisory board? So I was on the advisory board and I read articles. And then in, was it 2010, Matt, that we were at Asilomar? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in 2010, John wanted me to come and moderate a section of the IAYT's meeting. I thought, yeah, I can do that. Because I knew Matt was going to be there, and I'd known Matt for a number of years. And, and people, they were so nice, and they were so insightful that I thought, I, I want to be this nice too. <laughs> so I went through, you know, two weeks later, or three weeks later, I actually started a, a three-year program to get my IYT certification as a yoga therapist. And I went through yoga teacher training at the same time. And uh, it was fabulous. So now I, I teach in some yoga therapy programs, and, give workshops, written a couple of books. And, you know, so that's, that's my background. And, and now I'm a professor in physical therapy, and I try to bring in my background and my knowledge to the students. And there's always one or two that kind of get hooked on it and realize there's more, and the rest of them you just hope that sometime in the future they'll think of something. Something will pop into their head, and they go, oh, I remember this crazy guy said something about this. So that's my background. You guys must be excellent breathers and be very flexible. <laughs> she said breathers, not breeders, right? So I was... <laughs> <laughs> breathers. Yes, I know, Stephanie. <laughs> that was an example of Matthew's fourth grade humor. <laughs> I am at a much higher level. Notice I didn't even laugh. <laughs> But well, see, we're all I, laughing. <laughs> I really appreciate the fact that you guys have this, you know, interest in yoga. And I think that the PhD that you've pursued, Matt, is quite interesting. I mean, uh, you got your PhD in transformational learning theory. Um, what exactly is transformational learning? And what did you learn about this, this when you were getting your PhD? Because I'm not, I'm not really that familiar with it. Sure, sure. So there's a uh, transformational learning theory. It's a it's been around for oh thirty years, but it's the idea that you uh, instead of dumping data and facts and and skills on people, that you present a learning environment where they can examine and change the assumptions that underlie how they see the world versus uh, just telling them stuff. So. Uh, if you're doing smoking cessation, you know, you can sit there and show them ugly pictures of lungs and give them all the stats and that sort of thing. Or if you can create an environment where the, the person maybe has an experience of how valuable their breath is and that or how, it, you know, if they spend time in an environment with somebody um, and they discover that, oh, my gosh, I have a limited amount of time and how could I possibly waste my time smoking? So now you've changed their worldview. So it's a paradigm shift, essentially, is what it, it amounts to. And it's, and it's uh, structured around adult education. So the idea is that it be practical. It's not, you know, useless minutia of data and information, but rather it has a practical outcome. And, and so I kind of fell into it because when I was looking at PhD programs, it was like, oh, the last thing I want to do is, you know, do a study on ultrasound and rat's tails or something like that. And so I found the school and the school is based on, it's based on the yogic principle of transformation. That's what yoga is, is the science of transforming, radically changing or changing the paradigm or the footing that the person stands on. So you so you're changing the lenses that, that the individual sees the world from. And so we see that a lot, of course, in pain science now. Well, first the therapist, but also the patient's perspective on what pain is. You know, it's an output, not an input, and da 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 So um, it, was, it was a unique opportunity to, to ask how do we transform, how do we, how do we change people's worldview rather than, because we know just giving them information and uh, exercises doesn't solve things an awful lot of the time. So... So that's, that's interesting that you say that, you know, you had mentioned that you're on a lot of these task forces and you've collaborated with a lot of different people. Do you utilize any of these techniques in your daily life to try to persuade people to do the things that you want them to do? Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, 
but not in a nefarious stealth way. I mean, it's, uh, so yeah, when we, when we right now working on this, uh, this pain Congress that's coming up in November, where we're sitting down with the payers and all the major stakeholders and, and trying to figure out how we integrate care, you know, and actually do an integrative approach to, to pain care, which we know there's, you know, no one profession's got it, right? We, we got to do something in professional. So um, what Stefan and I did this summer was we uh, actually uh, spent a whole day training rehab professionals and yoga therapists how to dialogue interprofessionally, how to exchange information and how to sit in the other person's shoes and see their worldview. And when, when you do those types of activities, you, it shifts your own worldview too. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's part of what, what we do on a regular basis. And it's, and it's fun. <laughs> well, what advice, what advice would you, you know, one of the big things that I'm really into is advocacy. What, what type of advice would you give to physical therapists on how to utilize aspects of transfer, transformational learning theory to persuade payers or physicians, or even more importantly, I think the general public, that physical therapy is something that may help them treat a chronic pain problem? Well, the, the, one of the key axioms or principles is that it, it be practical, that it actually solve a problem or an issue for them. And so that means you have to have the ability to move out of your own worldview and, and see from the other's worldview, you know, form of empathy and not more than empathy, uh, just a, a way to look through their lenses and then with them it, uh, identify what what's what's of meaning, what's of, of substance and purpose for you, so that it is practical. And it's so if I'm talking to a uh, a referral source, it's not about telling them about what a wonderful therapist I am. It's about helping that person see how together we can we can shift the the workload for the for the client and also our own personal health. And so. Often what I found when I was in Scottsdale down here for 12 years with just a yoga based clinic was getting people in for personal experience because in PT, we tend to focus a lot on uh, conceptual information, you know, just know stuff. We know a lot of good stuff, but for the most part in my 20 some years of teaching PTs, we don't move very well. We don't know how to move up, which is another way of, of, of knowing. And we also uh, don't take the value of experience. And so to bring somebody in, let them actually experience the, uh, the transformational learning where, where, they, where they get their perspective shifted a little bit, that, that's, that, that really makes a big difference. And, and, it, and it goes with a lot of what Stefan got with, I think, with his Feldenkrais training, a very different approach to not moving in a, you know, triplanar direction with levers and, and that. So, um, so the, that experiential component, I think is key over words and data. I think that's a really good point to bring across because I know we've been talking with a lot of guests and we've kind of heard a lot of people talk about, you know, concept of how to really, really influence behavior and, obviously data, just shoving data in people's faces is clearly not enough at all. So I really like how you brought in talking about the empathy piece, putting yourself in their shoes, seeing where they're coming from, what are their thoughts on what they think's going on? What do they think they need to do to address it? And then kind of meeting them with where they're at and kind of getting at what's important to them, what's their why, how to make it easy for them to do. So I think that's, I think those are some very, very key takeaways there that I think clinicians could definitely benefit from. So thank you for that, Matt. And you know, I want to dive a little bit more into your book here uh, on, well, one of your books, which is Fostering Creativity and Rehabilitation. So first and foremost, why did you decide to write this book? And what are some of the biggest takeaway points from the book that you think all healthcare providers should hear? So it would have been in 2004 when I came up with this harebrained idea, right, stuff. And <laughs> um, so at that point, I was, uh, well, that's 34 years into my career. So I'd, I'd exhausted all the continuing ed courses and said, well, I've been going to the same courses for the last 20 years. Um, I've been watching, watching the profession do very much what we were doing back in the early 80s to a large degree and wondering, you know, so I'm, I'm watching that from the PT side of things, but then also my experience in the yoga was like, as I started to read that literature and, and have the personal experience and observe it, it work in the clinic, um, 
essentially the biopsychosocial applied, it was like, why is there this big tells us? And we, and, you know, and there, there are a few heralds in the darkness of, you know, we've got to do a biopsychosocial, but we're really, that's not how practice is being delivered for the most part. So, um, Part of my degree, my my dissertation chair and advisor is one of the world's leading social creativity experts, and so I learned a lot about institutional and individual creativity. So I just gathered a bunch of my buddies, uh, fifteen other people came in on the book with me. I I sent a letter out, and within a week, I had everybody signed up to contribute chapters because we all had the same kind of feeling, and we did it across all the rehab professions because there was kind of a head nod that's happening in speech, it's happening in art therapy, music therapy, you know, all across the, the rehab spectrum. So, so we put this book together. And uh, so the book, the key takeaways then are, um, one, we've, we are creative. We should, you know, that's what we are. We, you don't have to become creative. Uh, two, that every interaction with a patient, if it's a biopsychosocial spiritual interaction, should be an act of creativity founded on evidence, but driven by patient values and circumstances and, and the situation. Um, and then part, another chapter right before Stoffens was the one looking at, at how creativity and evidence-based medicine really do, do interface. And then that's why I wanted to bring Stoffens chapter in too, though, because he had that unique experience of, of structural system things that block creativity. So. Those, those are the, the big keys. And then the rest were by profession, their experiences, so each profession could see how other people were uh, utilizing their creativity. I think creativity is an essential part in not only providing a really great patient experience and doing something that is going to be part be important to the patient, but also in the world of science, we kind of get caught up in the data that we forget about the art part of physical therapy. How do you cater that to what the patient wants? So Stefan, I have a question for you. We have been talking a lot about trying to apply some of this transformational leadership concept, le learning concept to the real world and to patients. What does the most updated research say about successful learning in education, whether it goes towards applying it to patient care or DPT education in general? Well, I, I think if you start looking at, and I'm not sure we should say successful research, but where the trends are, I mean, there's lots of talk about, you know, should, should PT programs be, you know, taught in small groups? Should we, should we teach it in larger groups? You know, should we flip the classroom? Should we do this or that? Should it be, you know, student center and so forth? And, and the truth is we, we're not quite sure what is working and what is not working. You know, I mean, a lot of the theories, if you look at almost any country, a lot of theories that governments come up with are not that founded in research. I mean, it's just let, let's try this, let's try that. They claim that it's founded in research. You know, I, I think it comes back to getting back to the individual. I mean, I have, some, I have some students that, you know what, they do so well in the first year when it's all lecture based. And the second year when it's more hands on, they're lost. And there are some students where I have to carry them and conjole and try to do everything to get them to pass the tests. And when it comes to hands-on and practical stuff, they got it. So I, I think it's hard to say that, you know, it's, it's, it's one way or another. I, I think we need to be open and, and see this student doesn't re react well to this. Let's see if, if I can find another way to, to do this. Uh, I, I do have some issues with you know, when we talked about flipped classroom where the students should read everything outside and then come in and we discuss it. I think there are some basic knowledge that unfortunately we, we just have to, to lecture on. I mean, there are some basic sciences, there are some basic ideas in anatomy and kinesiology. You just have to sit down and learn it. I don't think there's any other way to do it. Uh, and then to, towards the second and third year of PT school, then we can put more of a responsibility on the students because what we want them to do is to be lifelong learners. I mean, that's really our biggest goal is to make sure that they are encouraged and curious about learning so that once they're out of here, they can actually go and learn on their own. You know, I, I listen to a lot of you guys' podcasts and I hear a lot about, you know, we should do this or that. And, and I think so too. I think we could create a much better PT 
during those three years. But reality is the PT I wanted to create, they would never pass the boards. And if they don't pass the boards, what's the point? So, so to some extent, we have to teach to the boards too. So it's more than just learning ideas. But I, I think what we're trying to do, at least the program I'm at and several other programs, is, is to more and more lay the responsibility of the students as we get into the second and third year so that they are lifelong learners when we get out there. Do you think that the do you think that the evidence isn't very good because there's not the funding there to do those studies? Are those studies just really difficult to do, or or why do you think that we don't really have a lot of this research knowledge to kind of back up what we do? I think part of it. I mean, part of it is is funding. You know, because you really can't. You know, you, you can't patent whatever you find in these studies. So there's no one that can make a tremendous amount of money off it, and that that is one issue. But I also think we're, we're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with their backgrounds. It's no different than when a patient of yours comes in, you know, they have their background, they have their beliefs. And if I, if I take all these backgrounds and beliefs and all these studies, I mean, that's, that's why we have a really hard time finding really good evidence for a lot of our interventions, right? Because the students come in with their beliefs and they have their ideas about what's working and the PT does too. So I think as long as we're dealing with human beings, it's it's tough to do research about what works really well and, and what doesn't work as well. Part of it is too is, you know, I mean, life happens to our students too, right? So I, 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 I think funding is part of it, but I think we're dealing with human beings and human beings learn different based on their backgrounds. You know, I, I love to teach the hands-on part. That's where I went, that's where I got my PhD. That was the only reason because I wanted to teach my, my profession not to do research necessarily, you know. So I, I got my PhD as easily and quickly as I could. But I'll never, I, I, you know, I, I, that's what I chose. I want to bring to my, to my profession, I want to bring to the next generation and share my experiences. And you know what, what Matt said about experience, I, I think it's crucial. And that comes back to patients too is, you know, we got to make them experience something and feel something and sense something. And that's hard to do. That's really a tough, tough thing to do. You know, I, I can take the health and wellness class that I'm teaching. When I first came to here, they sat for two and a half hours twice a week. And they learned all the theories about health and wellness, but there was no movement. Now we're moving for half an hour every, every class period, pretty much. And there's a lot of complaints. Some faculty members have even told me that there is no way I would participate in that, in that we have to move. And there are some students that say, oh, this is just like a glorified gym class. So th there's, there's a big disconnect between theory and experience. And I think that's, that's one of the hard things in PT is that we're very theoretical. We're not very practical and experiential. Yeah, and I know that was one point that you made in your book, I and mean, even in the prior episode on the podcast in the past that you and Matt did about kind of has the difference of how it perceives theory versus experience, which you were kind of alluding to, which I definitely think has been a prevailing theme that's come up throughout the show as well. And, and that's, I mean, that's part of academia, right? I mean, I have to teach three hours of lab to get one credit, but if I teach one one hour of, of lecture, I get one credit. So, so really all the practical stuff is really downgraded as not being nearly as important as the theory. Even though all our PTs are gonna go out and actually treat patients, you would think it would be the other way around, but it's not. Well, I think it goes back to what you said earlier about having to pass the board exam, partially. Yeah. yeah. So Stefan, that's actually a really good transition to my next question because with both of you guys having your PhDs and you know, currently with CAPTI requiring at least 50% of faculty at TPT programs to have a terminal degree, which can include the PhD, EDD, and the Doctor of Science, you know, but the fact of the matter is that DPT education costs continue to rise, resulting in more financial strain on people looking to enter academia due to needing a terminal degree, again, 50% of the time, of course. So first and foremost, what are your thoughts on this 50% requirement of having a terminal degree? And do you both feel that the terminal degree is worth the cost and time? Why or why not? All right, so the 50%, the, the I mean, we, we, we have struggled with that, and a lot of schools are actually struggling with that because there aren't that many PTs that are willing to go through the process of getting a PhD. So it, it, is, it is an issue. On the other hand, there is, there is something good about 
having a certain amount of people with PhDs or EDDs or DSIs because they are they have an understanding of academia that academia is more than just teaching. There's there are a lot of different components going into it, and I, and I think to some extent, especially if you if you're in a program that has that you have to stay on campus for a certain amount of time. You kind of get an understanding of it that I think is useful. So I, I think, you know, it's tough. And with so many new PT schools opening too, you know, it's hard for them to, to reach that 50% level, which means there are some teachers that I'm not sure should be teaching. But that's, that's a different story. Uh, so I, I see pros and cons with it. It's much harder for us to, to do it. And a lot, of, a lot of schools will kind of grow their own. You know, while, while they are teaching, they're going on to get them through mostly online or with short residences and so forth. So, so there, are, there are ways around it. But yeah, the 50% is, it's, it's an issue, I think, for most schools, unless you're, you know, one of the big research schools. Uh, as far as, is it worth it? In my case, I can say it was totally worth it. I mean, I, I got lucky. Uh, in that I was one of the first two people to start the PhD program at Central Arkansas. So actually my dissertation advisor, the chair of the program, who I've known for years, she actually called me up and said, this is more than likely your only chance of getting a PhD because we're not quite sure what we're doing and you get to run it yourself. You know, so I got to come up with my own ideas. I got to be very independent. You know, it was, it was great. I got my master's first and then my PhD. Uh, you know, for a lot of other people, I mean, they, they have to work in a lab with someone and they have to get on someone else's research agenda. So it might not be what they are interested in. And I, and I think that's one of the weaknesses. I, I think that's a tough one. You know, I was lucky I didn't really have to go into to take a lot of loans or anything for it because I was still working. At the same time, I was teaching at the school and I was some other things I, I was lucky. Uh, I can say that getting a doctorate opens a lot of doors to a lot of different things. Not necessarily just academia, but other things too. People for some reason think that if you have a doctorate behind your name, you're different. Clearly, based on me and Matt, you know, we're still just schmucks, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but but people, people look at you different if you have the PhD or, or your EDD behind your name. So I, I think you have to sit down and say, is it worth it? I make less money now than I did in the clinic probably, but it's a lifestyle issue. I take time off in the summer. I get to be with students. You know, it's it's. I have more freedom. I'm not booked with patients all the time. So for me, it was a lifestyle. And it was a it was a matter of giving back to my profession. I think that was the main reason I went to get my PhD. I wanted to give back to my profession. I think you have to be clear about why you're going back. I was clear. I'm not going to be a researcher. I am going back to teach them what I have learned in the clinic and through my experience. That's what I want to do. And, and the school is clear on that's why I'm here. I'm not here to do high level research. Then I wouldn't be at a small level art school, right? So I think once you know why you're going back, if you're clear on it, then it's worth it. Uh, if you're not clear on it, um, and, I, and I also think that you're better off waiting for at least five or 10 years before you go back. I know some people say you should go back as quick as possible, but. You know, the students like to hear your stories. They like to hear your practical experiences of crazy patients and things like that. You know, otherwise it's, it's just there and it doesn't come alive. So, so I, I think it's worth it if you know why you're going back, go in with open eyes. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things uh, my chair, Alf Alfonso Montori stressed was, if you're gonna go into the grind of a terminal degree, you better have a question that you're deeply yeah. passionate about yeah. so you kind of have to have been out there and gotten your shins bruised and yeah. and come up with a burning question because that, that's and, and then ideally then the process allows you to contribute to the body of knowledge that you make a some unique contribution at least in a phd direction and, um and so without that that uh creative aspect of your phd it's really hard to to slog through it. And then what do you have afterwards? Um, so, you know, so few people get their PhDs done, but the ones that do, then so few publish and then so few build their life work around it. So it's, so I, I would caution younger therapists to, to make sure you've, you've just got this question that you, you can't 
you can't get to sleep about and because that's what it's going to take to get through that process. And then it's worth it. Then it's totally right. worth it. Right. Yeah. And it changes. It is transformational because you, it is. <laughs> man, somebody throws a paper in front of you to have you take a look at it and your, your editor eyes come up as. You know? Yeah. Trust me. I, I was on math dissertation committee and I did that and you did not appreciate it. A lot of tears. Yeah. A lot of tears. <laughs> That's about the only time we fall. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, did you volunteer to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, pretty much. I think you got days. paid two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Matt is right. You got you got to be burning, and you got to know why you're doing it. You got to have something that you really want want answered. I mean, I I did my master's, which I set up like a dissertation on on body image, and I did my PhD on on development of palpation skills you know, because that's what I was really really interested in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing to be careful of is, you know, we're in this interesting period of history. <laughs> if anybody was alive in late August where, when we're actually talking that this is a unique period of time and it's not normal time. And so we're seeing it in every avenue. Um, and as fast as information is changing, as fast as uh, healthcare is changing, you know, all these different aspects, you want to be careful that to some degree, these terminal degrees are, are artifacts of an industrial age where you kind of ground out something and then you have something. And so that's what I appreciate about the, the degree process I went through. It was, it, it taught me how to, to, to learn and ask questions and uh, unlearn, relearn, you know, break things down because that's what the world is now. It's happening, you know, so quick. So, so I'd encourage people to, to maybe beware that industrial factory thing of you got one little product at the end of your degree, but th- does it really give you the, the chops to and, an- and start to answer that, that big burning question? So you guys have mentioned a lot of themes that we hear commonly on our podcast. Um, the first theme that you mentioned is that, um, you know, yet you should be passionate about what you, about these questions that you want to answer. The second thing that you brought up is money. You know, you know, something that I think a lot of younger physical therapists now are struggling with is the cost of education. And they may want to go back and get a terminal degree, but either they can't, they have to you do the PT salary in order to pay off their loans or that terminal degree costs them extra money and they have to take out more loans. So what are your suggestions to kind of change the path for new academicians to pursue these terminal degrees and make it more affordable, attainable, you know, incentivizing them to pursue this without having this massive shortage of qualified faculty members for DPT programs. Because, you know, the third thing that you've been talking about is this potential shortage of terminal degree faculty members. So what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I wish I had a good solution. I mean, first of all, I want to say that the path we're on as far as student loans, it's not sustainable. It's totally not. The, the amount of money that students own when they graduate from PT school is almost a crime. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I was lucky I graduated without student loans, which means I could actually take the amount of, or I could take the job I wanted. I could do, you know, the stuff I wanted to do. Uh, and a lot of students today, I mean, they have to work in a not-for-profit or get some loan forgiveness or they'll pay for 25 years. Uh, it, it's not sustainable. We need to figure it out what, what to do about it. I think the best, you know, and, and this, this brings back some of the problems too. I think both me and Matt, we were lucky. We were, I mean, I was in my, I was late 30s, early 40s when I got back to get my PhD and I had worked for a long time. So I I had some money saved up and I think for Matt too, financially it wasn't a huge burden for us. For the the younger students that want to get into academia, you know, I mean, it's getting harder and harder to get scholarships or grants to study for your PhD. Things are getting tighter and tighter for the schools. My suggestion is, I mean, we have a lot of adjuncts, a lot of our graduates and other graduates that come in and they'll teach, you know, a course here and a course there until they can start looking at a full-time job as an instructor. And then they can can work on their PhD at the same time or EDD. Uh, I think that's one way of doing it, but that's not going to work for everyone. 
it's tough. I, I, I really don't have an answer for it. I just know that the road we're on is not sustainable. Right. And I, and I think, don't tell us how old you guys were in 1997, but um, <laughs> do you know what happened in 1997? That was that was that was when the government passed the Balanced Budget Act, and it was going to be the end of Medicare. And we went through a, a PTs bubble where they were hiring, you know, PTAs for twenty bucks, fifteen bucks an hour. Um, and so I think we want to be smart about realizing that we're in a business cycle right now, and the business cycles bringing PT programs in and expanding them because they're a cash cow for the posting institution. I can say that because that nobody's writing my check for it, right? But that's the reality of it. Um, and so we're cranking the systems experience of more and more PTs flooded out uh, as a, uh, and they're in the system right now is able to put them in the jobs of some sort. Uh, one of my past students just took a, a 10 year loan forgiveness employment with a local hospital it's like I think they call that indentured servitude is what it used to be known as but understanding that as we're going through these cycles that we're gonna see a big change and a bust so to speak it happens everything's cyclical right um, and as we when you look at the data around this the health of healthcare right now right over one-third of the hospitals are insolvent another third are nearly insolvent and there's a third of them that are you know it's so the, this whole system's teetering and then we look at the proposed budgets and what that's going to do to medicare which of course then dump it into the er's which is going to crash the, you know so so i think we're we're coming to this spot that anybody tells you how to do this and how it's going to be is making it up i'm sorry but they're 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 making stuff up we don't we don't know and uh and it's such a complex situation with all these different flywheels of of, of influence that being sure you don't get yourself in over your head debt wise that that you can cash flow it with a, a modest job is critical for a career and if anybody's asking you to extend past that or where you're looking at a 25 year payback I don't see how anybody justifies that as uh, just from a, a money standpoint, from a, a, a money being life energy, right? How, but, but, but I will also say that to some extent, we're in a fairly good position too, because a lot of people that really want to go for their, their doctorate, I mean, there are online versions there and they can maintain a job. And even if they're, they're on a campus version, you know, that we can work weekends, we can do we can do home health for a certain amount. So I mean, there are there are we're in a better position than than a lot of of other groups that want to get it. So so to some extent, it's not all doom and gloom. There are there are ways of, there are ways of doing it. I, I think you know if I look at maybe too many. I mean, we're fighting diversity in our profession too, right? With the lack thereof. But, you know, as long as it's getting so expensive and it's getting even more expensive to get the PhD, you know, a lot of people, you know, are dependent then on someone else to pay their bills and so forth. So we're still going to deal with the middle class or upper middle class like that, that can afford this. So, so we're also fighting a lack of diversity and, and this whole higher education is, is not helping that either, the whole money issue. So. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, guys. And I know one solution that has been brought up a couple times on the show in terms of how to also contribute to maybe helping um, decrease the shortage of terminal degrees and qualified faculty for upcoming people that want to be academicians is finding a way to incorporate a terminal degree tract within a PT program. So having an option like I know Steph did the uh, master's in science and clinical investigation. Again, that's not a terminal degree, but that was an option that was available. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering from your guys' standpoint, A, is something based on, you know, with you guys having experience in those realms, is that something that is somehow realistic? And if not, what are some of the barriers or some of the things that we have to overcome to consider that as a possible solution? No, I think that come back, comes back to creativity, right? I mean, you have MD, PhD programs, right? And they seem to be pretty successful. So, so absolutely. I mean, it's a creativity issue. And, and will you know, how will CAPTI look at that? Will CAPTI allow us to do it? Will they give us the flexibility to do some of those things? Absolutely. The problem you're running into then is, then what kind of experience does this person have to get their PhD? What kind of hands-on clinical experience do they have? And, and I, I, in my PhD program, I actually had some faculty that 
you know, they did their internships, but they had never really touched a patient other than that. Or they saw like one patient a week and they say, oh, I have a client care. And I, and I go, no, you don't have a full schedule five or six days a week and trying to hustle that. That's a huge difference. So, so the, the weakness I see, and, and I see a lot of strength in the PT, PhD program, but the weakness is that are we then getting people that are really good in theory, but don't have the background in the clinical aspect? Yeah, and, and I think, so are they going to teach anything that's relative, relevant to the consumer? And so, you know, when, when I look at what personal trainers and massage therapists are, are doing now, it's what we did as PTs back in 1980, you know. And so when, when we ask how are we as doctors of physical therapy going to have relevance and, and what are our educators going to bring to, uh, to the students that sends them out ready to offer something like that. If there isn't that, uh, if you aren't sitting across from the patient that can't make their payments, that whose you know, spouses leaving them. And if you don't know how to be with that person and solve those problems, there's, there's a gap in the transfer from teacher to, to student. And I, and I think we're set, you know, that that's something that we just want to stay close to, I guess, because uh, we don't need a bunch of people with a lot of impractical knowledge because we've got a lot of people, you know, when we look at, if I have an inversion ankle sprain, I can go on YouTube and manage it pretty well until I have to decide that maybe it is fractured. You know? <laughs> so technology has shifted what was our sacred stuff 20 years ago. And, and it's, it's also interesting because I can say I have worked with, you know, some PT schools have – you know, people that are, have PhDs in anatomy and physiology and so forth, but they're not PTs. And I worked with some some faculty members that started like that, and they did a decent job. They did a good job. The students learned the anatomy, and then as they were teaching, they went through and got their PT degrees. And it was really interesting to talk to them because I said, "Yeah, my my the way I teach anatomy and physiology really changed because now I understand it from a different level." Uh, yeah, it's kind of like trying to find the best way to really get the best of both worlds without sacrificing one over the other, which yeah. sounds like a really hard battle to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate the private practice and business uh, lens that you guys bring to this interview, because I think that um, in many programs, perhaps some of the phys- for some of the faculty that are teaching don't necessarily have the lens of being a private practice owner. They may be, have been clinicians and had a full schedule or worked in a hospital, but I mean, you guys really understand what it's like to own a business, to keep a budget, to make sure that you're offering great customer service. And I really appreciate that lens that you're that you have, but I'm interested in, in this stuff on, um, I know that you mentioned in your book and prior podcast interviews about, you know, about this, but our listeners maybe who haven't read it or listened to it, what do you think are the biggest systemic limitations on creativity and innovation that exists in the world of academia that perhaps maybe this lens that you have in private practice brings um, to allow you to be more creative in your teaching? Well, I, I think a big issue is the whole concept of, of, of tenure and how do you get hired? You know, if, if I go too far out on, on, on my alternative ideas before I have tenure or even before I'm hired, I'm more than likely cutting off a branch that one of the faculty members are sitting on. And that sucker is going to decide if I get tenure or professorship or not. So there's a, there's a huge issue in if, if you're really creative and you really want to change things, that's not appreciated by everyone. But the people sitting there determining if you're going to get tenure or not or, or go from a, a assistant to associate to full professor might not appreciate that. So you have to be careful with that. Also, I need to get published. Well, if I send in a manuscript, that really undercuts some of the really basic beliefs that has lasted forever. And I come up with a completely different idea that might be very well researched. And, but you know, the people that are sitting there peer reviewing it, they were the ones that wrote the old articles. That's how you become a peer reviewer. You've already written a lot of articles. And they're gonna read this and they're gonna say, you know, this doesn't fit in with my worldview. 
and they have not taken Matt's courses in transformational learning. So they kind of, it, it's almost like a threat. You know, they're undermining my beliefs here with their new ideas. I don't think this is appropriate for this journal. And if I don't get published, I don't get tenure. So there are a lot of issues like that. Now, if you work really hard, you can find other avenues possibly to get published in alternative journals and so forth. But there, there's still, to some extent, there's an old boys network. You know? So that's, that's systemically, it's, it's hard to be really creative and come up with really interesting ways of teaching and, and also the students will evaluate you, right? So if you try something that is way out there, they're going to go, oh, no, no, this is not the spoon feeding I'm used to. I'm not sure I like this one. So everything is, is kind of pulling you back in. Uh, and most faculty were successful because we were successful in an old way of learning, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So what are some solutions for that then? I mean, you had mentioned potentially submitting to maybe an alternative journal, but as my, um, but I mean, there's a lot of predatory journals out there as well that you know, if you submit to those, that's, that's not a good thing. So, I mean, what are some other solutions besides maybe submitting to a different journal? I, I think writing in a way that things make sense. And when you get, I mean, I did my, my master's on body image and the advisor, Benita Lovelace Chandler, who I think the world of, she was very clear. When you do your PhD, don't, don't do this self-image stuff. <laughs> can you do something that will just, just a clear number on it that we can understand? And I, I just, you know, so I said, okay. Because she says, once you're out of here, you can do interesting stuff. So sometimes you have to, to just to get your PhD. And then once you get up there, you know, you, you, to some extent, you have to do a little bit of fit in. So, you know, you say, yeah, I can do some of this, but then you also do, do your own thing. I mean, I do, I do a lot of stuff with yoga and feminine rights, right? And they know that about me now. So now I'm okay to do. But I also can go in and teach ultrasound. And I'm fine with that too. You know, so, so it's a little bit of a give and take. And after a while, they... They understand, you know, that, oh, he's, he's, doing, he's bringing in some new stuff. But if you come in on day one and you're going to do all this new revolutionary stuff, it's like, it's not going to happen. So you just have to do it slowly but surely, and the students will pick up on it. Yeah, I would say um, that maybe we need to shift the pendulum away from the, the, the dusty research journals, too, and and look out in the field and the grassroots and see who's doing the really exciting stuff out there that's you know, leading things and then have academia come to, to value that versus just looking what's historical in PubMed, you know. So, you know, I had, had this little practice for 12 years, cash-based, two-month wait, no equipment, no overhead, and none, none of the four schools ever came and said, what are you doing and how are you so successful and, and what can we look at this and how can we study this and what would be, how, what's the application that our students might be able to take oh, away from you? I do that. I invite you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> that was before you were a, it's before you were a full professor. Though. <laughs> you haven't been here since you became a full professor. So. <laughs> But no, I, I think I think we need to shift the lens, you know, in academia to say things are changing so fast. We better get out there and and look at ourselves through our clinical grassroots and see who's who's out there kicking butt because there's a lot of people doing some cool stuff that doesn't have a single article behind it, but it's it's relevant. People are willing because again, that's the trend in healthcare, right? Higher deductibles. It's it's a cash business. So we're, and it, we're going to look back and wish we had $30 copays because now patients are coming in with $5,000 deductibles. So you're doing cash. And so every time can you deliver something relevant that they give you their credit card and schedule to come back and give it to you again? That's the question, you know, and, and who's going to have those answers? People in the hallways of institutions or the people that are out there hustling. So I'd really encourage us to get out there and, and get our fingers on the pulse of, of what's cooking and what's who's doing it. And yeah, we can go back and retrospectively gather the research, but by the time that happens, and then by the time that gets on the graduate test, <laughs> whole new stuff's gonna be happening anyway. So that, that cycle is going so fast as well. So. So yeah. that's a tension that's there. I, think. I, I totally agree with Matt. The pendulum's got to swing back to the practitioners, to the people out in the clinic. Uh, I mean, that's part of evidence-based medicine, right? 
it's not only research, but it's, it's the experience and it's the values of the, of the client, right? But the tricky thing is if I say, well, you know, and, and this has happened, and I said, well, you know, evidence-based medicine is also the values of the, of the client are, are influencing this. And then, then I hear, do you have research on that? So, so even that, I have to go back to the research aspect. We have to go back to, to giving the clinicians more power and say, what you're doing is really valuable. And then we have to go to Matt and say, why are people paying cash and waiting so long to see you? What are you doing differently? And we have to start bringing some of that in. I, I have one graduate who, who actually opened his own cash business, and I brought him into class. And the students really enjoyed listening to, you know, there are other ways of doing this stuff. But we got to acknowledge the people that are out doing the real work. Yeah, I really like that kind of bringing all perspectives kind of to everyone's eyes so that everyone's aware of kind of the practical aspect. I think that's huge. And going back to kind of refocusing on the clinician, because I know Carol Lewis actually had said that in her Macmillan lecture a few years ago. And kind of to spill into that is, you know, I know we had talked about some of these systemic limitations from perspective in the role of academia. But what if we switch gears and kind of follow that same question up, but now involving professional organizations? So, Stefan, what have you found or what are your thoughts on some of the limitations of creativity and innovation within our professional organizations? Well, to, to, to some extent, it's, it's very similar. I have to be, you know, elected. I have to, to follow this, the ideas that are, are most prevalent, right? If I'm too far out there. I'm not, I'm not going to be elected. I will probably not get to present at CSM or, or the local stuff, right? So I, I think to some extent it's, this, it's the same that we like the status quo. Don't upset too much here. Stay with it. Uh, I mean, I, I look at CAPTI and what we have to do as a school. I, I touched on it before. I mean, there's certain things we have to teach, whether it's useful or not. So I, I think the, the systemic limitations in the professional organizations are very, very similar to what we see in the schools is that the people that are already at the top of these organizations will more or less have to approve the upcoming generation. So I'd rather approve someone who kind of thinks like me or thinks similar, or maybe a little bit different possibly, but preferably very similar. It's also, I mean, there's also a reason why you see a lot of, of people with, within academia being at the top of a lot of these organizations because we have time to sit down and actually part of our job is to be involved in professional organizations. If you're in the clinic and you hustle for 10 or 12 hours a day, yeah, come home and work on APTA stuff after that. You know, so, so it's, it's again, it's a systemic issue where people in, in academia tends to come up more into the professional organizations. Now that I'm retired, I don't have to worry about getting kicked out. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I would look at it as we're, we're very much a pubescent profession. You know, we've got acne, we've got big feet, we've got big teeth, big ears. And we're trying to figure out who we are and we, we try to pin a doctoral title on us so that we're grown up and that sort of thing. And and even this, this new PT mission statement, you know, that just came out, building a community that advances the profession of physical therapy to improve the health of society. That is just staring in the mirror and trying to figure out if your nose is in the right place. And uh, it, we're not about a, a mission statement shouldn't be about advancing the profession. It should be about advancing the health of society out of which then the profession will that that would be an adult way to look at it. And, and so I say it in a in kind of a poking, perturbing kind of manner, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's uh, symptomatic of why we're not quite standing on our own feet and saying, damn, we know a lot about movement. We, we are the experts and because we're the experts, this is the practical stuff we deliver and, and then take it out and deliver it in, in new ways. And so, um, so, and I think we're still mired in that kind of self-absorbed looking at ourselves, wishing we were more important than we think we are, and, uh, you know, still fighting. And that's another chapter in the rehab book, Brandon, is uh, Ginger Garner's on power, power dynamics, right? So between our relationship within the healthcare power dynamics system and that. So, um, so we're, we're still struggling a bit under that. I think. And, and, and let's have no doubt about it. The public has a really hard time knowing who we are. I always have students coming back after every internship and there's always some patient who asks, 
Do you need a degree for this? You know, we have not managed to, to really let people know who we are and what we're doing. Uh, and, and some people say, oh, you know, it's, that's, that's the fall of, of the APTA, but it's not. It's, it's the practitioner that really needs to, to show who we are. And to some extent, academia, we, we need to teach people how to really tell our, our patients who we are and what we do and what we're good at, because we are good at a lot of different things. But how can we how can we bring that out, and how can we make our education and our, our interventions reflect that? I think that's one of the really hard things. A lot of my research, I, I did a lot of my lit reviews and stuff at the at a chiropractic school, and you know what? They are very clear about what they're doing. Might not be a great thing they're doing, but they're very clear about what they're doing, and they are very. I mean, everywhere there were signs that talked about what they were doing, how they were doing it. I mean, they got the message out, this is who we are, and there's no doubt about it. I don't think we have mastered that yet in PT, and, and I don't want to blame it on the associations. I think for a lot of practitioners, we need to have the mindset that, you know what, we're good at what we're doing, and we need to go out and tell people what we're doing, not market to the physicians necessarily, but let people know, hey, this is what I'm good at. And I'm doing this really, really well and be very clear about it and go, go out with confidence and say that. I totally agree with that. I think that that's something that's really essential for every clinician to do is, you know, before you start your exam, explain what you're going to do yep. during the exam, explain what a physical therapist is so that the patient is very clear at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do ask this question to everybody at the end of our podcast. And, um, you know, you've talked a lot during this podcast about things that you would like to see improve. But if, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, physical therapy or otherwise, um, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Feel free to mention something new or something we've already talked about. All right. So what I would change is having spent four years learning about the Feldman Price method and studying yoga for a long time and studying Tai Chi and Qigong and all kinds of crazy things. They are teaching from experience, from a movement experience. They are good at movement, not as good as theory, but they have a movement. They have, they have the anatomy built within themselves and they trust their own bodies. And if I could do anything, I would want the, ex want the students to have the experience of movement, of trusting what comes up from the inside and trusting what feels right and really learning how to move and sense it very kinesthetically. That's what I would, would love for our students to be. And uh, I would say just uh, institute a regular diet of taking the physical and stilling it on purpose for 20 to 30 minutes a day as, as a exercise in and all the things we know help foster the uh, prime, prime us for being creative and responsive rather than reactive. We, the science is there. It's there. We know it's there. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a movement skill of being still. And if we, could, if we could institute that for the faculty, do it for the students, and then bring it to our patients, I think that would, would revolutionize literally what we're doing. Yeah. I think those are some really good points, guys. And I must say, thank you both for all your guys' insight, because I've definitely learned a couple new things on here that I'm sure our listeners will as well. Where can people follow up with you guys online or, through, or how's the best way to contact you if people have questions for you guys? MatthewJTaylor.com, double T, Matthew. Stefan? Uh, they can find me at S-E-L-G-E-L-I-D at gmail.com. I've said for years that I should develop a website, but it doesn't seem to happen. <laughs> but I, I am pretty neurotic about email, so. <laughs> I love it. This has been great. You guys are doing great work. You all, really are. All three of you. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, we appreciate people like you guys that really are in the service of doing it and helping others do it. So the thanks is all to you guys. And thank you guys so much. Sure. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare 
A telehealth platform is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, Extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.